It's been a good week for me. I hope it has been for you. And uh, and I was telling Danny a moment ago, usually in these conferences, many conferences, and especially seems these here, you uh, reach a peak of what God is doing before the last night. And uh, that I think the last night is good if we could just come together and praise the Lord for what He's done. I'd like to start most of my meetings on the second night and end them the night before the last. <laughs> I've not figured out a way to do that yet. <clears throat> but I appreciate getting to come again. I appreciate Brother Jimmy last night, or the night before last, Brother Jimmy said, <clears throat> said only <clears throat> two things you can't do for Brother Dunn. He said, number one, you can't compliment him. You can't give him anything. It'll run him to do that. <clears throat> So far, Jimmy has been able to keep me from being run for a lot of these <laughs> many years. But I love him and love his family. And I love you, too. You all have become kind of a family to me. I thank God for the family, not just the immediate family, but for the family of God. It was some years ago, some time ago, we were having trouble with one of our children. <laughs> what else is new? But, uh, and they were an adult, and when they get to be an adult, it's very difficult to do much, you know, you can't. But, uh, one day I just sat down and said, I want to tell you something, you're free to do what you want to do, and that's fine. But I said, the crowd you're running with is lousy, I know what you're doing. And I said, that's all right. I said, I want you to remember something, whatever you do. There's one place and one place only on the face of the earth where you know you'll always be loved. You'll always be welcome. And that's your family. And I said, don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget that. And when you get out there and people disappoint you and mistreat you and take advantage of you, you know that there's always one place where you're welcome and where you are loved and you're taken care of. I, having said that, I said, now, don't you think somebody like that deserves better treatment than you're giving them? <laughs> but I thank God for my family, my physical family, the family God has given me. But I thank God for the uh, family of God, for the spiritual family. And uh, nothing on earth quite like it. Uh, the fellowship and the mutual love and just being in God's presence. It has been sweet for me to be here, and I appreciate very much your letting me come. I'm sorry I missed this morning, but uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I told Paul, I talked to him a while ago, I said, when I got up today, I knew that if I didn't come to Milldale, the kingdom of God would not fall. And I knew that Milldale Bible Camp would not fall, but I knew I would. And I wasn't able to stand up, and so I said, uh, <clears throat> nobody is indispensable, and uh, uh, so I'm sorry that I missed, but I'm glad to be here tonight. And what I want to do tonight is what I would have done this morning. So if you've not been there in these morning sessions, it may take you a little moment to catch up with us, but we'll not take the time to recap everything. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. And I want to read beginning with verse 16 through the end of the chapter. Now, the most famous verse in the book of Habakkuk, probably the one verse that most people who know anything about Habakkuk know that verse. That's the one verse they identify. Habakkuk's fame, Habakkuk's fame is based upon that one verse, is that one in the second chapter, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. But I think this passage in chapter 3 is the greatest demonstration, the greatest definition of what it means to live by faith that you'll find anywhere in the Bible. Habakkuk, the third chapter, beginning with verse 16, we'll read through the end of the chapter, verse 19. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. 
Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the flocks shall yield, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flocks shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine hind places. A couple of Christmases ago, my wife gave me a Swiss Army knife. Some of you, many of you are familiar with what Swiss Army knife is. This was the big deluxe kind that you need a wheelbarrow to carry around with you. But it has everything in it. I have to carry the instructions with it to know how to use it. It's got so much in it. It's got uh, scissors in it. It's got a nail punch. It's got a bottle opener. It's got a can opener. even has a corkscrew for opening bottles of wine. It has a wire stripper, a wire cutter. Phillips screwdriver, regular screwdriver, two or three other kinds of screwdrivers that I can't name, can't think of them. It's got a magnifying glass, has uh, tweezers in it, has a toothpick in it, and also it has four knife blades in it. When I looked at that, I said, I'm ready for anything. (laughs) I carry that thing with me, and I cannot think of any conceivable circumstance in which I would not be well equipped to take care of it. Car can break down. House can break down. Anything can break. World can break down. I can fix it with that Swiss Army knife. I'm equipped for any situation when I have that Swiss Army knife. I like to think of that Swiss Army knife in a way like my salvation. Wonderful thing about salvation is you are equipped for any situation. That God has given you the necessary equipment to meet whatever situation you may face. There are some things that will only work under favorable conditions. We've all been struck by the tragedy of that space uh, shuttle as it exploded, and the more they told about it and the more I studied about it, the more amazed I am at how fragile that thing is, just how fragile it is. And to realize that conditions have to be absolutely perfect for that thing to function. I'm glad Christianity is not that way. But I tell you, sometimes we get the idea that all conditions have to be just right, just have to be perfect in order for our faith to function. And we get the idea that if everything is just working out right, and if God is answering this prayer, and God is meeting this need, and this problem is solved, and this difficulty is erased, and this heartache is healed, then under those ideal conditions, under those favorable conditions, then... I can praise the Lord and live the Christian life. And we often have the idea that Christianity works best under favorable conditions. And if that were true, we would be in a mess. For I have never in my life met favorable conditions, totally favorable conditions. I don't know that you'll ever find in your life when every condition is absolutely perfect. Christianity works in unfavorable conditions. As a matter of fact, it works best under unfavorable conditions. And that's what Habakkuk is finding out. He is living in unfavorable conditions. And what makes it even worse is that God won't change them. He has cried and he has pled to the Lord. He has laid out uh, irrefutable evidence that God ought to do something as far as man is concerned. God ought to do something. The situation is extreme, to say the least, and yet God hasn't seemingly lifted a finger. And uh, Habakkuk faces the most awful of circumstances. To say the least, the circumstances for trusting God are unfavorable. And yet you discover here is a man who has found a faith that works under any condition, even the most unfavorable of conditions. And I think when we talk about this matter of trusting God and walking with God, and I think that one of the things the Lord has been doing in my own life of late, which needs to be done even more and more, is just like an onion, strip the life layer by layer a layer 
until you have absolutely no illusions about yourself, no illusions about your goodness, and no illusions about your ministry, and no illusions about your holiness, until you're stripped bare to the bone and you see yourself as you really are. And you get down to where the real guts of life is living. And that's where Habakkuk is. Too many of us live on the surface and we want to keep it that way. And yet there are those times when God is going to let circumstances cut us to the bone. What then, my faith? What about it then? That's why I love that old song, No Never alone, never alone. He's promised never to forsake us, never to leave us. No, never to leave us alone. And this is what Habakkuk had found. And I love that 16th verse when he says, When I heard, and what he's referring to there is, uh, I mentioned uh, yesterday morning that he prays in the second verse that God would revive his work. And then in verse 3, and beginning through verse 3 and all the way through verse 15, Habakkuk remembers what God has done in times past. And as it's a little different from other times, and uh, you can find in several places in the Bible, and especially in the prophets, when they go back over and they remember and rehearse the mighty ways of God, and they will use familiar places like uh, Egypt and Exodus and, and uh, Rephidim and things like this. But Habakkuk uses... Uh, the more obscure places, and it's hard for us sometimes to know exactly to what he's referring, but basically what it is, is God is demonstrating his glory, and God is demonstrating and manifesting the arm of flesh. And Habakkuk's remembering what it used to be like in times past when God walked in judgment. He's prayed, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. While you're pouring out your wrath upon everybody else, have mercy on me. And then he remembers what that means when God moves in wrath. When God walks in judgment, the earth trembles. And he uses very graphic places, a graphic description. He says in verse 4, His brightness was as the light, and he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. All of it is exalting a sovereign and angry God who is walking in judgment. And Habakkuk says, When I heard my belly tremble, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, scared to death, literally scared to death. He said, I liquefied, literally, I liquefied within myself when I thought about God, the old-fashioned fear of God, the old-fashioned awesomeness of God that doesn't jump up and down and give three cheers for Jesus, but liquefies within himself, just turns into rottenness. There is a little bug called a water bug lives in the water, why it's called a water bug. There's a more scientific name for it, but <clears throat> water bug. You'll find them around a lot of places. You'll find them mostly up around New England in the little ponds and little streams. But let's suppose someday you're standing beside a pond and there's a frog, bullfrog, sitting over there, blinking his eyes. Every once in a while, his tongue shoots out and picks up a fly or a gnat, just sitting there. You watch that frog. All of a sudden, something amazing is happening to that frog. He is deflating. Just deflating. Suddenly, he begins to shrink from the inside. He just collapses from the inside. And he gets smaller and smaller. It's like somebody's letting the air out of it. And after a while, a moment or two, there's nothing left but that full, complete but empty frog skin. Frog skin hasn't been touched, hasn't been marred, hasn't been cut. Do you know what's happened? The water bug has swam up underneath that frog and he has a long needle-like protrusion and he sticks it in that frog and immediately that frog is paralyzed 
but that little needle-like profusion is hollow, and when he paralyzes that frog, he proceeds to suck everything out from that frog, all the insides and everything, until the frog's totally empty. <laughs> but there's not a better description of what Habakkuk's talking about when he says, I heard your speech, and I heard what God had done, and I was like it. everything in me just liquefied. There was no stability within me, and I just liquefied like that. Rottenness entered into my bones, and there was nothing left. Fear. Now here is a man who on the one hand has exercised faith, and he says, Lord, regardless of the cost, Revive thy work. And at the very next moment, he's scared to death of what God's going to do in his life. But then notice, he says, that I might rest in the day of trouble when God comes unto the people and invades them with his troops. In other words, Habakkuk in one moment is filled with fear, but he moves from fear to faith. And he says, but this is possible, that I may wait calmly, that I may rest in the day of trouble. And I've underscored that phrase. My, if I could only learn to do that, to rest in the day of trouble, to wait calmly for the day of trouble. Literally, it'd be wait calmly for the day of trouble. The day of trouble is coming, Habakkuk knows. The day of trouble is coming, and I am learning to wait calmly for it. And I will rest in the day of unrest. And I will be calm in the day of anxiety, waiting calmly for the day of trouble. Now, how can we do this? I want to share with you tonight three principles that I think all of us have to be aware of if we're going to understand what it means to the just shall live by faith, if we're ever going to understand what it means to wait calmly in the day of trouble. These three principles are found right here in these last verses, but they're also a crystallization of everything that Habakkuk has said. Three statements. I want to make them to you. We won't spend a great deal of time on them, but the first statement is this. My dear friend, if you're going to wait calmly in the day of trouble, and if you're going to know anything about walking with God in faith, you must, number one, come to the place to realize that things may never get any better than they are right now. Sometimes things may never improve. Some things may never improve. Listen to what Habakkuk says in verse 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall not fail, and the flock shall yield no meat. The, uh, the, I get that wrong every time I read that. Have you noticed that? And the field shall yield no meat. And the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Now, Habakkuk is using a double triad of things upon which the economy and existence of a nation depends. These things represent the economic necessities upon which the existence of a nation depends. Now, what Habakkuk is saying, things have been bad enough but they're going to get worse. I have prayed and prayed and prayed, and yet God not only is not going to allow, is not going to change things, He is even going to allow things to get worse. It was bad enough when there was corruption within the land. At least we had foals in the, in, in the barns, and at least the fields gave forth their fruit, and at least the olives bore. But when God allows the Chaldeans to come in judgment, they will sweep away all of this. And what he's saying is, things aren't going to get any better. I thank God for those times when we pray and things do get better. And I don't mean to minimize that and don't anyone go away saying, well, that preacher doesn't think that God ever answers prayer, ever changes things. You know that's not the truth. God does change things. God does make things better. But what I'm saying to you tonight, folks, you're living, you're living in a fantasy land if you're not taking into account the fact that things may never get any better. You're counting on things getting better. You're counting on things getting better. I want to ask you something. What's going to happen to your faith? What if things don't get any better? What if it's as good as it's ever going to get right now? What if you're never going to pastor any bigger church than you pastoring right now? What if your church never going to get any better than it is right now? 
What if your life's never going to get any better than it is right now? What if things don't change? You see, we live in hope. Sometimes that hope is realistic and sometimes it's not. But uh, most of us, our faith and our hope and our praise is based on the fact God's going to change things. God's not going to let this happen. God is going to see that things get better. Now, I know they are at the final shot. I know that. I'm talking about here and now. Friend, you're not being realistic and facing up to the truth of the Word of God if you don't take into consideration the fact things may never improve. It may be as good as it's ever going to get in your situation. It may be. What about it then? What are you going to do then? You see, there's a great deal of difference. When I sat down a moment ago, Randy asked me, or Danny, I'm sorry, I keep calling you Randy, uh, but at least to call you. And uh, I'm sorry, Danny. Uh, I, I sat down and Danny said, uh, how do you feel? I said, I feel fine. He said, is that a positive, is that a positive confession? I said, no, that's true. I have a pastor friend who is really big on, you know, positive confession. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, all that sort of thing. And, and uh, I go see him, and he was having a terrible time physically. I mean, he was sick. This is all of us to it. He was having a terrible, terrible time. I'd ask him, how are things going? How you feel? Man, I feel great. Man, just feel great. Never felt better. Positive confession. I knew his ministry was about to collapse. I said, how are things going to work? He said, man, it's great. He said, it's never been better. Positive confession. His secretary came up to me afterwards, and she said, Brother Dunn, could I ask you a question? I said, yes. She said, where do you draw the line between positive confession and just plain old lying? Now, that's a pretty good question, friend. Where do you draw the line between positive confession and just plain, flat-out old lying? Now, you can go all the way. You can say all you want to. Things are going to get better. Things, And they may. All right? What I'm saying is, if you and I are going to be equipped to live the life that God wants us to live and know what it means to live by faith, you're going to have to take into consideration the fact that things may never get any better. They may never improve. I don't know if you've read Margaret Clarkson's little book on Grace Grows Best in Winter. I highly recommend it. Margaret Clarkson is a Canadian who has never known one day, who has never known one day of her life without extreme pain. But she's written a number of books and poems. Margaret Clarkson in this little book, Grace Grows Best in Winter, has a chapter that I find intriguing. The name of it is, When Pain Moves In to Stay. She says, there comes a day when you know you're not going to get any better and that pain is no longer a temporary guest but a permanent lodger in your house and maybe even master. Things may never get any better. What are you going to do then? You know, I've said in this pulpit before, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that there are times when the Lord inserts verses of Scripture when I'm not watching, you know. You know, there's some verses I've read a thousand times. I've preached on them a hundred times and... And yet, I look at them again and I'll see something there I've never seen before. What I'm thinking about now is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. <clears throat> there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able and will with the temptation offer a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, I was reading that not long ago. I think about getting a sermon on it until I read it. I've preached a bunch of sermons on it. Listen to it. There's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. God's faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Wait, wait, what? What? Wait, 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 just a minute. Some liberal got a hold of my Bible while I was asleep. Added, added scripture. I never saw that last part there. I can't, can't be right. That's... Oh, well, yes, it's not endure it, it's bear it. Of course, that means the same thing. You see what I'm getting at? I don't know how always when I read that I'd say, well, if God is going to make a way of escape, Period. If God's going to make a way of escape, 
That's it. That's it. Finis. No. He said he's going to make a way of escape. Why? So that you may be able to bear it. Well, Lord, if I'm going to escape, I don't need to bear it, do I? He said, listen, if I don't make a way of escape, you'll collapse under it. The way of escape is so that you may be able to bear up underneath it and take it and tough it out and walk through it in victory that you may be able to what? Endure it. Endure it that you may be able to bear up underneath it. When God says that he's going to offer a way of escape, he doesn't always mean escape in the sense that it'll never touch us. Man, I read about the, that verse where it says, God take note of every sparrow that falls. And one minute I'm saying hallelujah, and the next minute I'm saying, but hey, the sparrow does fall. The fact that God takes note of it doesn't keep the sparrow from falling, does it? After God destroyed the water, the world with the waters of flood, he put a rainbow in the sky, and they call that the Noahic Covenant. And every time you see a rainbow in the sky, I preached once on the gospel of the rainbow. God hung up his rainbow. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm never going to destroy the world against flood of waters. But I've got news for you, friend. There is no rainbow in your own personal sky where God has promised never to do you that way again. God has hung no rainbow in your own personal sky. And God has never promised you an exemption from these things. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is this, that we're going to have to take into account this one fact. Things may never improve. They may never get any better. What, what then? What about your faith then? You may never get any... This may be as well as you ever get. You may go to doctor after doctor, have surgery after surgery, take medicine after medicine. You may go to the Philippines in search of some guru like... Uh, uh, Andy Kaufman did. You may go to Mexico in search of something else like Steve McQueen. You may go to all of these people, and I don't blame them. I'd try everything I could too. But I want to tell you that you may never get any better. You may be as well as you're ever going to get. Your children may be as good as they're ever going to be. Your family may be as well as it's ever going to get. What about it then? What if things don't get any better, friend? Of course, the answer to that is acceptance. It involves acceptance. Now, folks, when I say acceptance, I don't mean resignation, which is passive. I'm not talking about this old business saying, well, there's not anything I can do about it. I'm just grinning and bear it. I'm not talking about resignation where I give up all hope and throw out all effort and I passively resign myself to my poor estate and begin wallowing in self-pity. I'm not talking about that. Nor am I talking about submission. I'm not going to use the word submission. That's sort of like knuckling under. Well, I don't want to do this, but God has got the goods on me and he's bigger than I am and I'm knuckling under. That makes you bitter and cynical. I'm talking about acceptance. For me, when I'm going to have to define acceptance for what I mean, acceptance means that I do everything that I can do to change it and to get rid of it, but in the inability to change it and get rid of it, I accept it as coming from God. I don't stop trying to change it. I don't passively sit down and resign myself to it, or I don't bitterly submit and knuckle under to God and to circumstances and get bitter about it. I keep trying everything I know that's right and good to change the circumstance, but at the same time, I accept it because God has somehow and for some reason allowed this situation to come into my life to do something in my life that he could not otherwise do. If I'm always looking for the miracle that gets me out of it, I'll 99 times out of 100 miss the greatest miracle of all. And the greatest miracle of all is that God in the very midst of it is able to do something in my life. The greatest testimony, the greatest testimony the world ever has is not when, when Christians are riding smooth down the highway of life without a ruffle or without a feather. I'll tell you when they start watching you, friend, and that's when your life starts falling apart. They want to see if you're going to react like the rest of them. You may miss the greatest miracle of all. And that's principle number one. Things may not get any better. Principle number two, if this is true, and it is, uh, he says uh, something, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. Now listen to me carefully. carefully. If this is true, then it means 
that it is meaning and not happiness that makes life worth living. It is meaning and not happiness that makes life worth living. Now, let me explain to you what I mean. A friend of mine, having a great deal of trouble physically, mentally, and otherwise, he went to a clinic. They sent him to a battery of doctors. He's a minister. Sent him into one psychiatrist, Christian psychiatrist. First question the psychiatrist asked him, shocked him. First question the psychiatrist asked him was, how often do you consider suicide? The minister jerked back a little bit. He was a little bit insulted that this doctor would ask a minister, how often, not just have you ever, but how often do you consider suicide? He thought for a minute. He said, well, I, I, I know I've heard, I've read that everybody in a sense has a death wish and people at various times in their life, like when they're kids or, that, you know, they think about it. But he said, I can, I think I can truly honestly say, doctor, that I, I don't ever seriously consider suicide. The doctor said, well, maybe I put the question badly. Let me put it another way. How often tell you something. You'd be amazed how many pastors, fine, successful, educated pastors feel that way. You'd be surprised how many doctors feel that way. You'd be surprised how many wealthy people feel that way. You'd be surprised how many poor people feel that way. Good question. He said, how often do you get to thinking life is no longer worth living? pastor thought about it for a while and he said well I want to tell you something doctor I'm a Christian I believe life is always worth living he said that's not my problem he said the problem is not the worthiness of life but the willingness of living it And the only thing that makes me put up with the weariness of living it is because of the worthiness of it I believe it has in Jesus Christ. He was saying what I'm trying to say to you that what makes life worth living, friend, is not happiness as we count happiness, but that there is meaning and purpose to life. The French philosopher who is far from being a Christian, you understand, but he said something interesting in uh, his little book, The uh, uh, Myth of uh, Sisyphus. He opens it up by saying there is only one truly physic philosophical question, and that is the question of suicide. Boy, I read that and I said, I knew he was nuts. But I went on and he began to make sense. He said whether the world revolves around the sun or the sun revolves around the world is a profound indifference if life isn't worth living to begin with. Yeah. What well, does it matter if they find a cure for cancer and lengthen your life if life ain't worth living? What difference does it make if 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 5 times 5 is 25. What difference does all of that stuff make if life isn't worth living anyway? The old boy was right. I wouldn't use the word suicide, but he's right when he said that the truly run question that everybody has to ask for themselves is, 
Is life worth living anyway? Is there any meaning to it? Is there any purpose to it? Or is just life a bunch of a list of absurdities and having no rhyme or reason, not meaning anything? It's like looking at the underside of a carpet, nothing but a tangled mass of threads and knots. If you could see the upper side of the carpet, you'd see structure and pattern, but we're not privileged to see the upper side of the carpet. We only see the underside, and it's just mass of tangled threads and knots having no rhyme nor reason, going nowhere in particular, and always arriving at the same spot. Is there any business to life? Is there any meaning, any purpose to life? That's what makes it worth living. And friend, if you don't have any purpose in life, it ain't worth living. I mean, if I'm just going to be born and born crying and live paying taxes and the weariness of giving up every morning and going to work and having to face the same old thing day after day after day and every once in a while you get hold of a little bit of happiness you get hold of a little bit of happiness and you think that it's going to last but it doesn't last and you have a baby born into your home and you think man my heart is bursting and then that child grows up and becomes rebellious and goes different ways and breaks your heart a thousand times and then about the time you think you've got it all together, the doctor says you've got cancer and you have six months to live, and that's the same day the IRS notifies you you're being uh, audited. And then your daughter is raped, and they can't prosecute the fellow because of improper search and seizure and he goes stop free and you say God is life worth living anyway now friends if that's all life is if that's just all it is if just no more an end of existence, existence of living and trying to stay alive until the grim reaper reaches up to you friend there'll be more to it than that and there is there is more to it than that. What is it? Well, it's fact, life does have purpose. Life does have a meaning. A meaning beyond which all the philosophers and, and uh, uh, unsaved theologians and all the rest of the bunch cannot, cannot see. It's that God in his infinite wisdom is working out a beautiful pattern and plan. And, oh, dear Lord, if I could see the carpet from the upper side, I'd rest easy tonight. If I could see the pattern and the structure of everything you're doing, there'd be no problem. There'd be no problem. But I believe there's a purpose. We don't have time. I'm already over. We don't have time to look. You go back and read that third chapter. You'll find God has a purpose. It's a sovereign purpose. You don't know what it is always. But then he says God went forth for the saving of his people. It is a saving purpose. Friend, I rest tonight in this one thing, that when God said to Job over in 42, he said, the latter end shall be better than the beginning. And he said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy after 8, he did all of this that he might do you good at the latter end. And before he uh, sent the Israelites into captivity in Jeremiah 29, he said, I know the thoughts that I have of you, thoughts of peace, thoughts of peace. And every thought God has towards me is one of peace. And he's doing it to do me good at the latter end. And the Bible says the latter end shall be better than the beginning. God's working out a purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. Don't have a clue to it. But friend, that's what makes life worth living. It, no, I, I'm not, you ever play Trivial Pursuit? Now, I've got news for you, friend. My life's not just a trivial pursuit. Nothing trivial about my life. I play a very important part in the eternal plan of the Almighty God. There's significance to my life. And I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, I've got to get hold of myself. I'm getting a little bit too excited. I, I'll tell you exactly why I resent these health and wealth boys and these joy boys and charismatic types that say you can be healed instantly and every time I may mention I'm sick, they say, oh, just think positive and all that's wrong with you is you don't have enough faith and just some sin in your heart. I'll tell you why. They are trivializing my suffering, making it insignificant. And I don't care much for that. What they're saying to me, and they come to me and I'm laying on a bed of affliction and my body's racked with pain and my family's coming apart at the seams and they just, oh, well, that's simple. He's there just sin in your life. They don't have enough faith. You mean to tell me you're dismissing all of my suffering with that little flip programmed answer that you give to C number callers? 
You call some of these boys on television and try to tell them you're a heartache and they'll shuffle you along to some lackey who's been programmed to answer uh, type caller B. And they trivialize your suffering. Now all your suffering doesn't mean anything. It has no significance. You just got sin in your life. And I won't buy that for a minute. You tell me that my heartache and my suffering and my hard times and my struggle to obey God and my struggle to overcome temptation and my struggle to fight the devil and my struggle to stay pure and holy in the midst of an impure world, you say that means nothing and it's trivial. It's not so, it's significant. That's what makes life worth living. That's what makes life. If you can reduce life, if you can reduce all of life to one little, two little, neat little formulas that you can punch into a computer and send out a computerized letter to everybody that sends in an orphan friend, there's something far wrong with our brand of Christianity. A lot more to it than that. Well, no, I'm going to stop before I get... All I know is, friend, I just don't want my heartache, my suffering made light of. I just don't want it dismissed by some fella sitting up there in an ivory tower. Try calling him at midnight and getting him to travel a hundred miles, hold your hand over a hospital bed. Yeah. Now what are you going to do? I tell you what you're going to do, you're going to do what old Habakkuk did. He said, yet. Yeah, I love these two words. Verse 17 says, although. Verse 18 says, yet. Man, you can make a sermon out of that, Paul. (laughs) Although and yet. My soul. Although. Worst is happening. Although I've just lowered my loved one into the ground. Although my church has just run me off. Although, although, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Now, folks, that's faith. Now, that's faith. That's faith. Well, you can't do anything against a man that has a yet in his soul. Until the devil is able to carve yet out of my vocabulary, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and joy in the God of my salvation. And with every although, God help me to meet it with a yet. Well, there's one third principle, and I'm going to quit. Principle number one is things may not get any better. Principle number two, it's not happiness that makes life worth living, it's meaning. By the way, I just want to plug my series that I didn't get to finish. This probably as well, because what I was going to do tonight is kind of weird. I'm not sure y'all ready for that. <laughs> but you know why it's so hard for us to say yet when there's an although? But we had to start being instead of having. Now, I want to tell you something, son. When God trims the fat from your life and the fig tree doesn't blossom, and the fields don't bring forth any fruit, and the stalls are empty, and brother, I mean you're down to the bare bone, and you don't do any having. The only thing you can do then is just be. And it's a lot easier to have than it is to be. Just thought I'd throw that in. I may, I may finish that next time I'm here. Let me just mention this third thing. Even at that moment, Principle number three, God is able to take you in the lowest of valleys, elevate you to the highest mountains. Our greatest revelations of God I've received haven't come from some church service, they've come from the valley. Greatest decisions I've ever made in my life not been at an altar, some altar call. It's been in the darkness of the night when I couldn't sleep. Been in the lowest. Been in the lowest. That's when you get to know God, folks. 
that's when you get to know God. Now, I'm just going to tell you something. You can accuse me of being a, 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 a uh, uh, pessimistic type of fellow if you want to, but I'm going to tell you something, friend. You'll never get to know God like you want to know him and like God wants you to know him until it gets dark around you. But it's in those moments, and this is the amazing thing. I'm telling you, it's the beatenest thing I've ever seen. God can give you the greatest joy and can elevate you to the highest of places when you are the lowest in every other way. It is unreal. It is unfathomable. And only God can do that. Listen to what he says in verse 19. He said, The Lord God is my strength. Well, he always was. Yeah, I know, but I didn't know it until I needed it. Long as I've got the machinery to move mountains, I don't need faith to move them. Long as I'm able to get along myself, I don't need God to get me along. But God puts me in a situation, I discover something. The Lord God is my strength. By the way, I've been doing a little... Have I mentioned Romans 8, 37? Uh, along the same line, 837 says, Today in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, I've been doing a little bit of looking into that. And you know, we say God is able to make us more than conquerors. Yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors, super conquerors. The only place that's found in the Bible and it's very difficult to translate into English. Nobody knows for absolutely certain what it means. It's super conquerors, more than conquerors, or it could very well mean better than conquerors. We are better than conquerors. And here's what he's saying. The context is, you know, he says, all the day long we are slaughtered for thy sake. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. We are despised, blah, 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 all these bad things. Happen. But in the midst of it, he says, in all these things we're more than conquerors. Now, could it very well be that what Paul is saying is that conquering doesn't mean that you elude those things. You see, I, here's the trouble that I'm, I'm having. They're, while they're being slaughtered, while they're being slaughtered, while they're being despised, he says at that very moment we're conquerors. Well, that doesn't look like a conqueror to me. No, what he's saying is not that we're conquerors. He's not saying we're conquering over that. He's saying, listen, even while they put the knife to our throats and slit us and we die like a dog, we have something better than conquest. What is it? Well, it's found in the last verse. Don't know why I didn't see it. And all of these things, neither height nor death nor angel nor any other creature shall what be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Friend, that's the conquest. That's the conquest. I've got something better than conquering those guys. Those guys coming at me with a knife. I'm going to slit my throat like a dumb sheep. I want to conquer it. No, there's something better than conquering. Go ahead and let them slit your throat, but they won't be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And so he says, the Lord God is my strength. You may not have known it, but he was. And then he says, and I am finishing really. He said, he will make my feet like hind's feet, deer feet. He will make my feet like hind's feet, deer feet. Now, what he's referring to here, this particular kind of hind, this particular kind of animal, was sure-footed on rocky terrain. Years ago when I was in college, I had a horse named Dusty. And the reason I got him is because it was quite the fashion in the place where I lived in the churches I pastored uh, that uh, we were down there by the Kaimishi Mountain Range in Oklahoma, and we loved to go backpacking uh, and then backpacking wasn't a pack on your back, it was on the horse's back. And that's the kind of backpacking I like. But we'd go backpacking up into those mountains. Well, you had to have sure hoof footed horse. And I got this Dusty. Well, I want to tell you something. Dusty was great on flat straight away. Son, I used to love to run him. They, they tried to talk me into running him, racing him down there at those, those quarter horse races. He wasn't even a quarter horse. American saddle horse. His great grand, his granddaddy was top show horse in the United States, and uh, he'd do all that fancy stuff like catering and parking and and rocking chair and all that sort of stuff, you know, and uh, rocking chair canter and all that. Boy, but he could run. I mean, that horse could run. You get him on a flat away, man. You put him out there on that track, and the wind whistle in your ears, and that tail be parallel with the racetrack. It's wonderful. But he could not walk two feet. 
for that trip it. <laughs> the clumsiest animal I've ever seen in my life. Scared me to death to walk him. Wasn't afraid to run him. Safe when you're running, just sit up there like in a rocking chair and let him run. I hear run all day. Never stumble, never miss a foot. But you just try to slow him down. We'll walk back to the barn and he's just flopping all over the place like that. Well, you never dared take him up in the mountains, you'd kill yourself. <laughs> There's some people like that. God help us, I can run flat out on a straightaway, but dear Lord, you start getting me on the rocky places and getting up in the mountains where the going's tough and treacherous, I don't know. That's what God's saying. He said, I'll give you feet like hinds feet. He said, I'm afraid. Preacher, I don't like the way you're talking. I don't like the way you're preaching. I'm afraid God's going to make me walk over some path rocky ground. I got news for you. He'll give you feet like hinds feet. He'll give you, he'll, you, you... You won't slip. You won't slip. You have steady foot. You'll have steady foot. He'll give you steady foot. And then he says, He will make me to walk upon mine hind places. You know where the hind places were? The hind places were those places that were very precarious, but they were the places you went during time of war to elude the enemy. God said in those times, he said, I'll make you to walk upon your high places. I'll lift you up. I'll elevate you to such spiritual heights. The enemy won't be able to follow you there. And isn't it true, haven't we found it to be true, that sometimes in the midst of the battle, God is able to just sort of sneak us off from the enemy and elevate up to the highest places we've ever been in our life, and the enemy can't touch us there. The highest experience ever had. When the enemy down low, look, where'd he go? Where he was? He? I saw him here a minute ago, and God's elevated you up, walking on your high places. Lord, that I may rest in a day of trouble. May the Lord bless us.